We are very excited to um, co-host this program today with the Provost Office and the Office for Campus Life. And on your tables are several handouts about upcoming events, our faculty institutes in May. This is our second annual set of these institutes, all full day programs on topics of interest to faculty. And if you have any questions about any of our upcoming events, please feel free to email us at CTRL. And now I will turn this over to um, Fanta Av from the Office for Campus Life, who is going to tell us about the panel and about our conversation today. Fanta? Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to have all of you here. Um, this panel, I think, will be a repeat <laughs> for a while to come at American University. Um, for many of us who are spending a lot of time with students, and also a lot of time with faculty. I keep hearing this sort of refrain, wow, it's a very different generation of students that I have in my classes. Um, and I'm trying to get a better sense of, you know, how can I um, continue to engage them perhaps differently? Um, how do I, in many ways, navigate sometimes uh, the um, sort of challenging waters um, that we may find ourselves in? Um, and then more importantly, I really, really care about my students' success and I want to see them do well and I'm not always sure how to best support them in doing so as a faculty member. Um, and so in really putting together this panel, I could have had, honestly, a panel of 20 faculty here who can provide us with context on what's happening. Um, there's really, there's a lot of intentionality in sort of who I wanted to be at this table, but also just to get the conversation started with the understanding that this is a conversation that really will involve you, the audience, because I'm very curious to hear your thoughts and, and sort of your perspective on this. Um, the goal is a simple one, and that is to get a sense of what are the trends that we're seeing that is, that's emerging in the classroom, but also what are the ways in which we're trying to sort of get a better sense of how we can support our students, and how can we stay focused on the most important endeavor, which is the learning. You know, how do we ensure that learning is taking place in the most productive ways within our classroom setting. That's the ultimate goal that we're after with this panel and this conversation. And so without further ado, um, I'm going to briefly introduce them. Um, and then I had asked them a set of questions to ponder, having to do with trends and observations, but also more importantly, how are they navigating this in their classroom and what lessons have they learned that can inform some of their practice moving forward as well. And so we have Andrea Brenner, who is here. Andrea is also with Andrea wears many, many hats, and you'll notice that's one of the things about the folks here. They tend to wear many hats. Um, Andrea is also with the sociology department, but she's really the director of the university college program, and will be very involved with the gen ed program. And Andrea also was in charge of piloting a program, a course, um, this past fall, and so for first year students, and so she'll be talking about that as well. Then we have Kiyo Kim. Kiho is with the environmental science program, and is also the director of the AU scholars program as well. Again, someone who wears multiple hats here on campus. We have Laura Shorts. Laura is with the uh, School of Public Affairs and has been teaching in the University College program as well. And then you have Amanda Taylor. Amanda is with the School of International Service and directs the international communication program at the graduate level, but teaches at the undergraduate level and teaches first year students as well. And has a background particularly in working with multicultural uh, working in multicultural environments and really looking at sort of a culturally responsive pedagogy in the classroom as well. So I'm very happy that all four of them could be here with us uh, this, uh, this afternoon. And then, we're, so we're going to get started. And I'm not going to go in any specific order, but I'm going to actually start with Lara, <laughs> with Lara uh, who's going to get us started on um, what's the perspective, what, what you're seeing. And then we will make sure we open it up to the audience for further conversations about what we're hearing and, and how we're navigating those. And I'm going to ask everyone to speak into the microphone. And also, when we go to the q and I'll remind folks that I, we need you to speak into the microphone, because several of our colleagues who couldn't make it here today, we promised them that we'll have a videotape so that they'll have an opportunity to, to get to hear what took place today. So thanks to the panel. Yeah. Good afternoon. So quick show of hands. Um, how many of you have ever told a freshman not to take an internship or sign up for too many activities. Okay, you're behind the camera, but let the record show everybody. Right. How many of you have ever told them they need to listen to each other 
and hear before they respond. Okay. But how many of you have ever given them or yourself or anyone else the advice that they need to give a preview of what they're trying to persuade you of up front in their oral presentation, in their paper, um, in, in, the, in their office hours? Have you ever told them, you know, you need to offer me a thesis and then follow it through? Let me know where you're going. So that's pretty much exactly what I have now learned to tell myself in this endeavor of teaching first years. Um, the challenges are, first of all, that their lives are a larger component of the work they're doing, possibly honestly, than, than their work in the classroom. Um, I find, I promised I wouldn't do a kids today, but I find that that task of, of accomplishing that occupies a large amount of real estate and that when people come to me, um, often it's not, I don't understand this complex idea, which is also a thing, but I haven't managed to make all of this work to the point that I can turn in this paper on time or answer this question or raise my hand in front of my peers. And so the lesson that I've got on that is that I need to, in first years, not just teach to the text or teach to the students, but teach to the time. Um, freshman year and first semester freshman year are a subject area. You could have a department of freshman year, which is what I actually understand Andrea is taking on. Congratulations. It's, about, it's like going first on the panels. Great, that worked out for you. Um, <laughs> um, you need, I think, as well, not only to keep on getting them to listen to one another, um, but take more moments, actually not just between semesters, which I think everyone does, right after you pick yourself up from that grating morass and you know reintroduce yourself to your spouse and um, start flossing again. You say, oh, I wish I had done this differently. I think taking those moments during the semester is really important to me now um, and something that I'm advising myself to do. Um, and the last is, and this is partly a subset, I think, of teaching to the time, um, but teaching in the department of freshmen, is remember that the first year class and remember that the freshman class isn't just the easiest, the first time they've read a particular text that'll be the foundation before the next text next year. It's actually an introduction to college and how to college. Um, and with those three things in mind, um, what I'm going to do is make myself a little bit vulnerable and tell you the uh, failures I've encountered in coming to what sound like brilliant insights uh, when not wrapped in the context of, of despair. <laughs> um, so we were asked about right trends, challenges, opportunities, lessons learned. Um, so trends, uh, this won't surprise you, uh, students have a self-perception that I think can be challenging as they start learning to college. Um, I would roughly say in my experience about 40% of my first years um, sense that I, oh my gosh, everybody knows more. Everybody's such an expert and I don't. How will I keep up? Um, about 40% say I've known, I know everything. I've already learned everything and this class time is an opportunity for me to catch you up on, you know, what I am and what I have to offer. Um, and 20% who show up and say, so pretty much I'm at school, as I have been at school, and so I'm going to do school, learn school. There's a teacher. She might have something to offer. Um, and, and so do I. And the only 20%, right, who are actually correct are them. So I think the first year in part is that challenge of bringing everybody to the, well, actually, we're just in school. And in your case, at the beginning of school, um, let's see where to go from here, right? So the challenges around that, that's a trend that I see. And I also see that people incidentally are less brave over time, even since, even since I've started here. Um, there's a little less bravery, a, a competitiveness, concern. I don't want to speak up in front of this other person because she knows things. Well, she kind of doesn't, but also so do you to, to an extent. A um, little more fear of failing. A uh, little less bravery around some of the classes that are actually you really need. Um, 
you just don't go out and learn statistics on your own and you're beach reading. You know, you need that. You don't learn information literacy and research methods, um, you know, as a hobby after pottery class at the community center. Um, it's hard to be brave and do those things, and I think being a little less brave in your life and in your academics makes that harder. So I do see it as my role immediately to say, you're taking as much econ as you can someday, and you should probably learn music too. Um, so the challenges that I see in terms of what they come in with academically um, is that in my time here, and I've, I've taught college writing as well, and in the law school, um, I'd like to coach badminton if possible, maybe <laughs> teach pottery, I just, I'm trying to be more ecumenical. About 5% of my students know how to craft an accurate paragraph that's structured to do and be what a paragraph is and does. Um, and I do have, a, you know, I do find myself doing word count check on, on um, papers and saying in the margins, this is a 450 word paragraph. The maximum allowed uh, length of an op-ed is 750 <laughs> words. <laughs> that's all. Um, so that's a challenge and I think it's a huge one because a paragraph is a unit of thought. And if you're trying to be conveying units of thought and aren't writing paragraphs, um, that's gonna get tricky. Um, I find that they don't know, however, what the fundamentals of writing are, and I don't just mean in creating that paragraph, but actually the point. What is it I'm trying to make? And I find myself saying this is a machine that conveys and persuades. Um, as I said, I find that school life networks <laughs> is an enormous challenge for the students, and it becomes a challenge for me to suss out, actually mapping my syllabus now, understanding where people are right before Thanksgiving, understanding where they are right before spring break. Um, and trying to you know, suck the marrow out of my calendar. Um, so I find that those are challenges. I find that the major challenge, the biggest one, is in um, students being not completely aware of what they need to ask and find out before answering. So in the CLEG class that I designed, the Introduction to Communications, Legal Institutions, Economics, and Government major, I'll introduce a hypothetical. What should this television network do when there's outrage that they fired someone for saying homophobic things on his reality show? Um, what I'm trying to see is if they find out uh, what's their market, who watches them, who are the corporate sponsors, how do they feel, how much money do they get out of this or that, what is it people really want? So asking them to ask questions is hard, and I find that it's actually the toughest thing, which is why for my CLEG class, which is my brilliant, uh, we'll call it a learning experience, a rebuilding year, a minor league ball, whatever you like, um, I'm actually building in information literacy next year as an introduction to the CLEG major. You need, uh, Olivia Ivy, by the way, said so she called me, and now uh, I have witnesses. Um, <laughs> right. Um, I'm going to do and actually grade and assess exercises in which students um, convey what they need to know before answering. Um, and that's a listening skill. Um, and I'm going to work a peer critique component, component into that. Um, I found a challenge is that um, people want very specific instructions. Um, and I've been making them more and more specific and I realized that I need to stop doing that and um, force a little bravery. Um, I've tailored and tailored my CLEG class to have more and more specific instructions and I realize that what I should do instead is state in advance. This is the hardest part is understanding the question and I have to let you go and explore and challenge yourself and answer that question. Even if I don't hold your hand in making it so specific it isn't fun anymore. Um, and that's a job, and I think that just has to be the introduction to the CLEG major. Now I mentioned um, giving an outline or a preview of your piece. Um, there was a time when I thought, designing the intro of CLEG class, okay, I will outline and preview the four CLEG disciplines. And I need to do that. But what I really need to do is outline and preview college. So this semester, I introduced Bloom's taxonomy period pyramid as an entire, actually, day of the first uh, month of CLEG class, explaining you uh, 
at the bottom of this period, pyramid, which I think most people have seen, it describes con comprehension, understanding. You move up, application, questioning, critical thinking, synthesis. And I explained to them that in high school, comprehension, uh, you demonstrate comprehension, the game is done. Congratulations, it's expository writing. But the comprehension piece actually happens at home, reading in the library, in office hours, which are free, 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 and available to all of you, and no extra charge, did I mention, in verse 206G. Um, and, and, and you're getting into the classroom and maybe applying, and you're, you're moving to the top of that pyramid, and I need for you to see that all of your first year assignments are beyond this expository high school moment. And that's my timer. Um, lessons that I've learned are the three that I previewed. What strategies have I found effective? Um, unsurprisingly, the same things that are effective with the middle school <coughs> curriculum I'm working on. Utilizing GFAP assistance, peers who know how to college, um, freshmen who have just learned how to college, very important. Group projects, um, life out there in the world. We are never in any job ever where we are solely assessed and succeeding based on individual work other than in college as an undergraduate. Um, so I utilize group projects that teach people to listen. I use um, simulations like moot court, which I do, and which student, in which students find their voice. Um, and I now, although I didn't think I would in the beginning, try to offer books that are narratives and interesting stories of people who have done the Clegg type things in my, in my school of public affairs major, like Becoming Justice Blackman, incorporating stories and biographies um, that can give people a sense of how someone else got from their childhood to someday uh, being the professional or the adult that this person wants to be. Um, so that's my, that's my story, and I'll stick to it until I learn that it's not the right story. <laughs> Thank you. Great work for us to get started. I'm going to ask Ashley Andrea to follow up on that. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I feel like I know freshmen pretty well. I've been in a classroom for 17 years in the Department of Sociology. I've taught almost only first year students. Um, and then this past year, as my first uh, year as the director of University College, was 605 first year students. I, I, I've, known, I've known my share. Um, but really nothing hit uh, so close to home for me as this past year, where my daughter is a freshman in college for the first time. And, uh, and she's a pretty confident kid, didn't really think much about marking that transition of her first day of class, and I got my first text uh, after her first day of class, and it said, um, I attended my first class, and I have an actual professor for the first time. Guess what? I spoke up. And I thought, man, that really said something to me. Uh, that, is, that is a ritual worth marking. And that's not something I have done. I, Every once in a while, especially if I'm teaching in the fall, a morning, uh, Monday class, you know, I will acknowledge how many of you, this is your first college class ever, and you know, are you nervous, are you excited, that kind of thing. But until that really hit home with my daughter, that was, that was sort of a ritual that I think I'm going to acknowledge a little more in the classroom. So what I want to do with my 10 minutes here is um, to talk about five main topics. And to me, these are the big five teaching strategies for first year students. Some of this material is actually for, uh, from the Center for Teaching at Vanderbilt University. Um, they are a phenomenal resource, uh, and it's something worth checking out online if you're interested. Uh, so quickly, let me tell you those five, and then I'm going to go into depth in each one and sort of give you an example from my own experience. The first one is learning to teach to a variety of learning styles as well as a diverse student body. And that's, those are two big categories, and sometimes they dovetail, and sometimes they don't. The second one uh, in teaching first year students is to provide feedback early and often. The third one is uh, preparing for students with emotional reactions. That's a biggie for me. Uh, the fourth is clarifying expectations and strategies for learning and writing, which is very much what Laura said. And the last is posing complex real life problems in the classroom. So the first one, teaching to a variety of learning styles and a diverse student body. Um, I think we often teach how we were taught, maybe how we parent, how we were parented. Uh, but we also need to remember that our first year students have had far fewer examples of teachers in their lives uh, and different teaching styles than we have. Um, many of the students, uh, 
come to us from uh, different backgrounds than ours, very different cultures uh, than other students in the class. Many of these students have come out of private schools or they've come out of small um, high schools. Um, and many of them have had the same teacher repeated year after year after year in the classroom. As a matter of fact, most students in the United States have the same teacher all day until the age of 10 or 12, with the exception of changing for some specials. Um, so I believe that we really need to be sensitive to the variety of ways that students excel um, and learn, um, and also include a bunch of different learning experiences in our courses. When I prepare to meet with a first year student in an office hour, for example, I sort of rack my brain, who is this student? And you know, if it's another Caitlin from New Jersey, I have many of them. And I have to remember which one I'm talking about. But I also need to take a step back and think that this student is coming to my office hours and doing the same thing. They're thinking, well, this is my professor who expects me to teach in class, right? This is my professor who X, Y, Z. And that's different than, than their other teachers, their other professors. So at the same time, I'm, I'm kind of um, sussing that out. They are as well. So an example I can give you about teaching to a variety of learning styles and teaching to a diverse student body um, is, uh, is something I do in many of my classes. I hold debates in my classes, as I'm sure many of you do. But I've had students, especially first years, who have told me over the years that, um, that debates freak them out, that make them really, really nervous, um, especially if class participation is difficult for them. So, I make a point now in my debates of having uh, a written portion of the debate that they come prepared with, as well as the oral portion that will uh, they will participate in class. And each part is weighted equally. Uh, and this gives an opportunity for the introvert and the extrovert, for the English as a first language versus English as a second language speaker, uh, to really benefit. Um, I also make a point of having students prepare for both sides of a debate. And again, this is just making the assumption that a debate is in the binary. We'll get to the gray stuff in a little bit. Um, but uh, I have students prepare academic articles for both sides of any debate that I assign. And when they walk into class, I assign them to the side of the debate. Um, I think that this really, over the years, um, has helped them alleviate some of the stress uh, that they feel in terms of choosing their own side of the debate, right? Who, 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 who am I? What kind of identity or, or experience am I representing? Providing feedback early and often. First year students make the transition from excelling in high school to meeting expectations in a college classroom, and I believe that they can really, really benefit uh, early in the first semester hearing feedback. A student who must wait several weeks to get their first paper back in college um, has no sense uh, of how they are doing. Um, and because of that, may not really know when to go ask for help. We're frustrated when our students don't come to office hours, um, but yet sometimes we're not giving them feedback early enough. So I believe that we have this myth that I'd like to call of first year enlightenment, right? That's when uh, all will become clear when a student enters college, right? But really first year students are just experiencing daily life management and many of them for the first time, because many of them have come from experiences where they've had parents or family members managing their life, or at least portions of their life for them. So what I feel, although I'd love to have those enlightenment moments for the first years, my aha moments in the classroom are usually related to um, new material, new educational material, new ways of thinking, rather than life philosophies of adulthood. Uh, so traditionally, age first year students really aren't any different uh, than they were in their senior year of high school. Uh, just because their title has changed and their location has changed, uh, I think we really put a lot more pressure on them and believe that they could experience much more than they could have four months before that. Um, one example that I use uh, for providing feedback early and often is I'm sort of known as the note card professor. I keep a big stack of index cards with me at all times, and I am often writing little notes. And I'll <laughs> hand it to them upside down so only they can see it, and it'll say something like, you added a lot to the class discussion today. Um, or, man, I really like how you've been presenting your ideas. My favorite is, to a student who's never volunteered before and finally has the guts to present, I'll say, I'm so glad you shared today, I really noticed that. Um, these note cards are something my students look for. They're not always positive. Um, you know, would love to hear more from you. Um, why don't you stop by my office hours and we can talk about that paper. Uh, to me, these note cards work. It's just a way that, that I, I feel that I can communicate. I, I know other professors might do that you know, verbally. 
Uh, number three, preparing for emotional reactions. Uh, so some topic discussions will elicit intense emotional reactions from students. And I find particularly students who haven't been exposed to sensitive or controversial topics in a classroom setting. Um, I try to get into the mind of a student who might be coming to my class from a religiously affiliated high school or a same-sex school or a school where they haven't had racial or ethnic diversity in the classroom. And this is a really new experience for them and sometimes a frightening experience for them. Um, so I provide opportunities. I provide structure and guidance about their possible reactions, telling them in advance. This is what students have ha problems they've had in the past with their emotions, and these are normal experiences. Um, Many first year students haven't really had the opportunity to analyze complex situations um, in objective ways in a learning environment before. So um, I teach a course here at AU called The Sociology of Birth and Death. Uh, you can imagine we cover quite a bit of emotional topics in that class. One of the topics that always elicits a very emotional response is the topic of suicide. Uh, can't teach about death without teaching about suicide. Um, I over-prepare students, I feel, for those triggers in my <coughs> syllabus first. Then I tell them in the class before the week we're going to be talking about it. This is what's coming up. Then I send them an email before that class. And then the morning of that class, I tell them once again. But this is not necessarily an excuse for them to skip class, although that is an option. Um, I encourage students to stay in the class and to just listen and learn if they're uncomfortable. But I also give them, you know, I give them that opportunity to sit quietly and say nothing. You won't be graded on class participation today. I'd rather you be here and absorb. Um, I also give them the opportunity to step out of the room if they need to. Um, and then, of course, there is always the opportunity if they feel they need to, uh, to, to skip that particular week. I do let them know if they choose to miss that class because of this potentially triggering event, emotional event, I tell them I do expect them to see me in an office hour that week, and then we can have a conversation. That doesn't mean I'm going to delve into their personal uh, situation, but we can talk about suicide in my office in an academic light. Uh, we can talk about it in terms of a, of a recent journal article, uh, statistics about suicide on college, uh, college campuses, whatever it might be, that removes them from their emotional state. So they're still responsible somehow um, being a part of that. The next one is clarifying expectations and strategies for learning and writing. And I know Laura talked about this as well. Um, many first year students have, I believe, have really have naive ideas about knowledge and learning. And I think therefore, at least what I do is I very clearly clarify my expectations for student learning and performance uh, from day one in the syllabus. So helping students uh, to understand sort of what is expected of them via descriptions, examples, and feedback on their student work is important. Not only don't students, uh, first year students always ex understand what's expected of them, but even when they are clear on those expectations, I can see them on an assignment, I can see them on a syllabus, they don't necessarily know how to go about to meeting those expectations. Uh, so have students understand and practice approaches to learning in and out of the class classroom. Listening for key ideas, for example, in a lecture. So there might be a lecture or there might be a guest speaker, and then we'll spend a little time talking about the key ideas <coughs> that were covered. I do the same thing when we watch a documentary. Uh, we, we spend some time talking about the key ideas of that documentary. Um, learning in class, reading for comprehension. Uh, I believe that those may help make the kinds of transitions that we need for students to think as college students. So an example I want to give uh, in the social sciences, which is my field, as in many academic disciplines, there's a particular writing style. And that's very difficult for first year students. They go from their chemistry class to their sociology class to their writing class. And it's a totally different um, writing style that they're expected to do. Um, we also have, in each discipline, <coughs> excuse me, a different citation guide. So I don't expect my first year students to completely uh, understand what goes into their first paper. So I'm extremely lenient with the grading. I'm not so lenient later. Uh, so what I do with my first set of papers is uh, I don't mark them down, for example, on citations, <coughs> on paragraph structure. Uh, but when I grade this first set of papers in a particular class, I make very, very, very detailed edits, and I expect them to read them, uh, all about the paper structure and citations. This is the only time during the semester that I will do this, and I let my students know this. For their second paper, I expect them to be writing that, typing that, with the first paper's edits next to them. And I make that very clear. Uh, when they hand in that second paper uh, and they make the same mistakes 
that's inexcusable to me. Uh, if they're new mistakes, that's excusable to me. <laughs> My expectations are clear for both the first paper, when I handheld them through the specific guidelines, and the second paper, where I expect them to learn from the careful edits I took the time to make. And my last one is posing complex real life problems in a classroom, and that's sometimes very scary. Um, so I guess what I would say is that in high school, students are routinely taught algorithmic problems, right, or problem solving. So for example, think about a geometry proof. You might teach those skills and then ask the students to apply it to a proof, a different proof they've never seen before. Uh, you learn the rules and then you apply them. But in college, in addition to algorithmic problem solving, students are also asked to participate in applied problem solving. And that is new, I find, to many first year students. Many high schools don't cover this. So when we hear students say something like, that test question wasn't on the homework, or that test question wasn't in the class notes, I think what they're really saying is, I don't see the difference between algorithmic problem solving and applied problem solving, right? obviously don't use those words. Um, we need to explain that. So one strategy to help students move out of this questioning, uh, if what they learn in class is useful in the real world, right, we've heard that before, is to ensure that students encounter complex real life problems in any classroom. These are problems where right or wrong, or it's all just an opinion thinking doesn't suffice. That's not the real world. Helping students progress past these phases is very challenging. I find it challenging but they won't progress if they're not given the opportunity to do so. I believe that we need to teach our students that the world is not binary, that it's not two sides of every debate, not black and white or rich and poor or fat and thin, that in fact what college is about is that whole gray area, right? Whether that's identity or an academic topic, learning what's in the middle there. So I often have what I call gray area discussions in my classroom. These are normative to have mixed emotions, to have undecided, real opinions and ideas. A student may come into a gray topic or a gray area of discussion saying, I think I know what I'm talking about, but part of me is pulling me this way. Or the Catholic part of me feels this way, but the other part doesn't. And I think it's really important to have those discussions in classrooms. Thank you so much. Sorry, we're getting some interference. I'm just going to turn the mic off for a second. Radio tower it has nothing to do with us. <laughs> so, in case you were wondering, are you? Am I hearing music? No, you're yes, not delusional. You are <laughs> hearing music not in the background. Those are not. That's true. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Pastor, for for this invitation. Um, when she first emailed me to to um, to talk about this issue, I said, "Sure, great. I'll have no problems coming up with a huge list of things that we can cover." And since that time, I've been really struggling to come up with things which I think are really substantive changes in our student body. Uh, part of the reason why I have been struggling is because there are two co-founding factors that we cannot control for. One is there is observer bias, because I've been changing in my perspective of how our students are changing. And there's also detection bias, that is, we are looking for different things, more things, as time has changed. And so as I was thinking about various factors, various behaviors, characteristics of our students that may have changed over the 16 years or so that I've been teaching here, there were a few that I can actually put my finger on and say, you know, this has substantially changed over my lifetime here as a faculty member at NU. And those things really didn't come into focus until I began teaching in the AU Scholars Program and AU, uh, the University co uh, College Program. Because while I teach a lot of 100 level classes in the sciences, they're not necessarily all first year students. Let's be honest, some of them are seniors, right? <laughs> this is area five general education. And so uh, my assessment of these students is, is also uh, clouded by the fact that, that they're not all behaving as freshman students, because they're not. And so when I began teaching in the University College first, uh, I just, that was my first experience with first year, first semester students. But even then, those students are biased in their selection because when they choose to live in living and learning communities, they are self-selecting into a particular kind of a classroom. And so with all of these caveats, it was very difficult for me to come up with the list of things that I think are, are 
interesting anyway, and perhaps substantive in the way our students have changed. I think foremost, uh, their ability to socialize is probably the most evident to me. That is, their ability to turn to one another versus a mobile device or a computer has, I think, changed since I started teaching here in 2000. Not because I think there's some inherent fundamental changes in the genetic makeup of the students, but simply because those things are simply available to turn to. They can easily turn away from people around them and look at their phones and not look like what we would call wallflowers. Now they have something to do. They have important things to do, important Facebook messages to tend to. <laughs> and so now they have something legitimate to turn away from other people. But I think that's not what they want to do. I think if they had the opportunity, they would turn to their friends and engage with them. They just need somebody to poke them and prod them and push them into those interactions. Um, the second thing um, that I think has, has also changed is that um, they're, they're not sure about their relationship with the faculty. Uh, they see us probably more now than before as sort of black boxes. You know, research goes in, lecture comes out, assignment goes in, grades come out. But for the most part, they really don't know who we are. And, and sometimes they're struck by the fact that we actually have lives, that we do things, we go out and we like things, we listen to music. Uh, during this recent trip to Cuba with a bunch of AU Scholar students, uh, they got hold of my iPhone, they looked through my music playlist, and they were amazed by the fact that, number one, I listened to music, and number two, they actually recognized some of the artists in my playlist. <laughs> Only because their parents listened to it, but they recognized some of the songs. Uh, I think that sort of personal interaction is something that they crave, but they don't know how to actually make happen. Because uh, they want to know that we are people that they can turn to when they are in need of help or you know, in need of advice. But they don't know that for the most part, especially as first year, uh, first semester students at AU. Uh, the last thing, which I'll just very, very briefly mention, is that we give them a lot of credit for being tech savvy, but they really are not. They're terrible. <laughs> they may be able to Snapchat up to Wazoo. But if you give them a couple of advanced instructions on how to use Word, PowerPoint, or Excel, which they've been using since grade nine, right, or even grade seven, they can't. They don't know how to change the margins. For, ask somebody how to change the default font on their Microsoft Word document, right? 99% of them will not know how to do that. So while they have access to all this technology, uh, we can't assume that they actually know how to use it in any sort of uh, uh, systematic or in-depth way. In terms of the practical uh, challenges and opportunities we have as, as faculty, one, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is our classrooms, the physical classrooms. It is not set up for the kinds of interactions that we need to have with our students to engage them in the variety of learning styles that we've, that we've talked about. They are still, in many places on campus, stuck in individualized seats sometimes separated by space and these things that you fold out and fold in or have fixed seating in which they can't really move around. And they have the idea that this, these are fixed seats and this is where they sit for the entire time and they listen and they go. We are trying to change that. I know that a lot of us arrange furniture, uh, make people move around, and that's something that I try to do as much as I can. But it's very difficult when you have those classrooms that simply do not allow for sort of fluid movement of students and faculty within that space. I, I try to overcome some of those sort of spatial issues, uh, social issues, by asking students to engage in uh, team challenge questions in the classroom. They have to get together with a small group of people, uh, walk around, make sure that everybody's vocalizing a possible answer. There's a scribe who writes the answers down. And from day to day, I try to make them change the groups, make them move around to let them know that it's okay to reach out to people around the classroom, uh, to also to reach out to the faculty, to me, if they have any questions of clarification. That we're not in a fixed situation, both intellectually and also spatially, in those classrooms. Uh, the other opportunity I think we have as faculty is, is to see them outside of the classroom. And by that, I don't mean you know, go to concerts with them. <laughs> But maybe go to the baseball game with them when we have these sort of university outings. Go to a sporting event. Go to a chorale concert at the Katzen Center. And, and have them see you actually partaking in the things that they partake in. To remind them, yeah, we are people. Uh, we have our interests. We have our, our, our lives. 
and we have children, we have pets, we have all the things that they have in their lives, and then if they needed to reach out to us, we have some areas of common ground. Uh, and if you also have this great opportunity to take students out on field trips where you have no space limitations, if you're standing all together in a metro, those boundaries are no longer there. If you go out to the zoo or the Smithsonian, the art galleries, those boundaries aren't there. And the ability to communicate with them, both academically and personally, those are really great opportunities, incredible opportunities to get to know them or them to know you as well. And Larry and I recently came back from a trip to Cuba. Uh, we really got to know our students. They really got to know us as well. And I think we had really both for the students and the faculty, we had real trans transformative experiences that really pushed them in a, in a uh, very positive direction in terms of their place at AU. I'll stop there. Thank you. Hi, thank you. So um, given where we are in the conversation, I want to ask you to do a small activity. So if you have a piece of paper, an actual paper, an actual pen out in front of you, um, you can do this on a piece of paper using a pen. If you don't, feel free to just think about it in your brain. What I want you to do is us to collectively take one minute to either free write about or just think about a time when you made a mistake. Okay. So what I would tell my first year students in terms of free writing is I'm going to say go. And when I say go, you just start writing. I don't care what you're writing. You could be writing, I don't know what I'm going to say here, but just start letting it flow, OK, until we say stop, all right? If you're thinking, I want you to just kind of open your brain, let it, let it sort of flow as freely as you can until we say stop, all right? So the prompt is, think about a time when you made a mistake. Go, one minute. Okay, stop. So I'd like you to turn to someone next to you, ideally in pairs of two or pairs of three, depending on how you're laid out, and share as much as you're comfortable. If you wrote something very personal or thought about something personal, feel free to self-edit a bit, right? But, but share a bit about this, this moment, and specifically not just what you did, but how you responded, okay? So I'll give you two minutes for this. So make sure you've switched to the second person. Make sure you're turning to your second partner.
let's come back together as a group. You have a lot of good mistakes to share out there, don't you? A mistake-ridden room. I know, it's all full of mistakes. Okay, so let me ask if there are any brave volunteers out there who may be willing to share a mistake they made and, and maybe how they responded. Yes? Um, right behind. Microphone is Thank the you. Uh, sure, I think I'll take one that uh, happened um, in college. Uh, and I actually relate the, I, I talk about this in my classes so that students understand that um, uh, even we mm -hmm. fail or screw up. Mm -hmm. So um, I was in college from 1967 to 71, so there was a lot going on. Um, and in one of the two semesters in my junior year, um, I forgot what classes I was registered for. I thought I knew, um, but I saw um, that I was getting an F in urban planning, uh, which I had no idea that I had actually registered for. But, but um, ultimately, um, I BS my way with my dean out of the uh, out of the class. Okay, thank you for sharing. So, so the strategy was BSing in response to the mistake. Okay, thank you. Everyone, write that one down. Thank you. One other. Anyone else willing to share a time when you made a mistake and how you how you responded? I'm not afraid to call on you out there in the audience. Okay. Yes. Can we, let's move to a different table. I drove about 500 miles out of my way uh, going from here to Atlanta because I was stressed out. <laughs> Thank you. And how did you respond when you realized you were safe? Um, do we want to know? I was pretty embarrassed, <laughs> but I was alone, fortunately. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I just I had to obviously reroute. I think I heard about that case of road rage on the news, possibly. <laughs> okay, so, so thank you. I and mean, I think, you know, what this is designed to show and hopefully, um, hopefully for all of us to feel for a minute is how rarely we actually talk about mistakes um, and how vulnerable making it is to, in fact, share them. And I think um, I was actually thinking about this panel and I got this edition of the Harvard Education Magazine in the mail and the title is Learning From Our Mistakes. And it actually talks about the importance of um, mistake making. And, and when I was thinking about this panel and what I would talk about, I was thinking about how nervous I was about making a mistake on the panel, <laughs> right? And, and thinking about how much one of the things I've observed with my first year students is the real fear of making an error Right? And, and I think it can manifest in multiple ways, some of which the, my colleagues have talked about here. And one can be this perfectionism syndrome, right? Either not wanting to be wrong because you're afraid it will expose some dimension of your identity to your faculty member, who you see, as Kiko was talking about, as this sage on the stage, right? Um, or the sense of, I know everything, and if I say something wrong, it somehow undermines my sense of myself as a smart, effective student. Right, who's been successful and gotten to college. Or I think for some of our students, um, and I feel this myself sometimes, particularly our students who are coming from historically underrepresented backgrounds, first generation students, others, um, students of color sometimes here, is this notion of imposter syndrome, right? A fear of making a mistake for fear of triggering some kind of stereotype about you or people like you and how that might impact the way you're seen and understood by your faculty and your colleagues. So, what I want to talk about is, I guess, how we can try and encourage our students to make mistakes, right? Um, and, and how we can also, just as, as you said, expose our own mistakes along the way and our own vulnerabilities um, as faculty. So I think that, that the, first, the first way I think this works effectively is to make sure we're paying attention not just to what we're teaching our students, but to how we're teaching our students to learn, right? Not just the content of the syllabus, right? But how are we training them to think um, and how are we training them to sort of understand their own learning in a metacognitive kind of way, to be aware of when they are making mistakes or when they're being effective in the way, like you talked about the note cards, right? How are we consciously attending to, to our students learning about their own learning? Um, and so I think 
that's really related to this idea of a growth mindset. Carol Dweck talks about this. We've probably all heard about this in our, in our pop uh, psychology on Facebook somewhere, right? But, but this idea of, of if our students have a growth mindset, it really comes oftentimes from how they respond to when they make mistakes. Do they shut down or do they continue to pursue? Do they, do they engage in a, curious, in a curious way about why did I make this mistake? How can I learn from it and how can I move forward? Um, and I think the same thing is true for us. We have to humanize ourselves as faculty and remember it's okay for us to make mistakes. Um, because when we play with our pedagogy, it's scary. We're afraid to, to mess up, right, and to look vulnerable. But I think it's actually really important for our students to, to see us make errors and for us to talk through what we do when we make errors and to model those moments in our own classrooms, right? So I wanted to talk about just a couple of strategies that, that I've used um, to deal with my mistakes that I inevitably make <coughs> in class, right? And I think um, one is I always try when I make a mistake, for example, yesterday in my first year seminar class, I actually spelled something wrong on the board, right? Now I do this a lot. I have moderate dyslexia, and I've learned to deal with it over the course of, of my academic life, but it's something really scary for me when I get very close to a board to write something. I somehow can't see the word very well, and I can't self-correct in the way I can when I'm writing at a distance. So you know what I did? I named that. I said, oh, I can't spell. Here's what I do, here's why, and here's what I do, and here's how I manage it. And I said, any of you out there um, have Google in front of you? Here's the guy I'm talking about. Here are his theories, right? Can anybody find how we spell this? Can anybody speak German? How would I spell this German last name on the board? Okay, so I'm kind of modeling that when you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world, and there are resources available for you to correct that mistake. And I, as you know, faculty member, can still make them, and that's okay, right? So I think modeling those when they come up um, in the moment, and also I think when we respond to their, to their work, for specifically in their writing, I like to do this. So, so when my students give me their first piece of writing, I actually don't give any written feedback. Um, I give verbal feedback to them. Um, and I, you know, I have this wonderful first year seminar in SIS, so they're small, it's 19 students. This is something I can do in my office hours, which I require them to come to. Um, but I think it's also something you could do in a class if you came up with a writing workshop and you sort of you know, count, you work with students one-on-one -on -one over the course of a block class. I think you could actually do this in class if you don't have the time to do it in your office hours. But I actually talk to them about their writing choices. I ask them to talk me through why they approached the paper in this way, what were they thinking about, right, how did they approach the piece. And then I talk them through um, my feedback. And I don't give, I don't sugarcoat the feedback, but I give it to them in a way that I think when we talk about it, it shows that writing is a process it's something we practice, and it's something we learn how to improve through dialogue and through engagement. Um, so so that's, that's sort of one strategy that I use there. Um, I also always have students write something that they wrote the first, usually, I, us I usually give this assignment before class starts, and then I make them come back to it at the end of class, look at it, um, and then analyze how they wrote, not just what they said, but how did they approach um, the prompt question and then they need to rewrite it, right? Taking into account the feedback and the notes that I made them take while we had this conversation, um, but really laying out what did I learn about writing? What did I learn about the content in class that changed the way that I would approach this prompt now that I've taken this class, right? So again, developing the idea that learning, um, that the brain is a muscle, we have to exercise it, we practice, we improve um, over time, and we sometimes make errors. So I think, um, one other way that I've tried to help students kind of become metacognitive about their learning um, and, and give them a ca capability to respond to mistakes is I use something I call a double entry journal. It's a really basic strategy. Um, and essentially you take, you take a piece of paper and you just draw a line about a third of the way down the page on the left hand side uh, vertically. And you use the right hand side of the paper to take notes as you regularly would, right? So this can be something you use if you're reading, um, if you're reading a article, it can be something you can do during a lecture. I do a mini ethnography with my students, so it can be something you can do when you're doing field notes, right? Um, and you use the right-hand side for the substance. But the left-hand column, you actually use for your metacognitive reflection on what you're, what you're writing about. So it can be anything from, if you're reading an article, all of a sudden when you write something down and it prompts a connection in your mind to something in your own life, or something in another one of your classes, you write it down um, 
exactly next to where you made that comment about the substance of the text or the lecture. Um, this reminds me of my world politics class when they were talking about realism. Or, oh my gosh, I want to share this with my mom because we had this happen at home. Or, I have no idea what the professor is saying right now, <laughs> and I need to come back and check on this. Or, right, so you can use it in multiple ways, but essentially to help students track their own learning, it also becomes a way for them to anchor their learning because you're forcing them to make connections between what they already know and what um, they're learning. And then finally, it allows them to track their own mistakes and their curiosities and their questions. And I tell them to, if we're doing it for a reading, um, in preparation for class, they can bring that to class and the students who are afraid of messing up and raising their hand to speak, I say, look, you've got questions on the left-hand side of your page here already laid out. So when the faculty member says, so how did you find so-and-so's reading on X? You can raise your hand and you've got the question right there. Just read it off your paper. So it's a way to sort of prompt them to push themselves towards being brave, as you said, and allowing for the, for the possibility of that kind of growth um, that we know they need to encounter. So I'll stop there, but um, I, hope you, I hope you continue to engage in mistake making. <laughs> Thank you to all four panelists. Um, now we're going to open it up to your reflections and some of your observations and comments. Um, and then I think, you know, then Mary Clark and I will, will sort of wrap it up. Because I actually have a couple of sort of observations that I gathered from the panel here. But we're opening it up to the group um, for your sort of your reflections, some of the things you've heard, how does that connect to your own experience, um, some of the things that you've worked on in your classrooms that you felt has made a, a difference in sort of the, the approach to teaching, et cetera. We we'll, we'll welcome all comments and, and, uh, and observations. Jill, microphone please, thank you. Thank you everyone. Um, so I have a question for Laura. Um, you mentioned groups and one of the things that I'm thinking through is how to effectively use groups with freshmen because part of this is getting them to find their identities and get feedback on their work. So I was curious if you might elaborate on that particular dimension. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So there are a couple of ways that I use groups or pairs. Um, one way that I use groups is I create a group assignment that I make very clear is going to uh, be graded rise or fall or five of you together. Um, in the Clegg class, um, the assignment is simply, um, first semester it was identify and solve a problem. Identify gave a bit of vertigo. So I identified them this semester and let people sign up for one of five. Um, and it's solve it. And it is actually graded by their peers and not by me. They, gave, they give a 10 minute presentation with three minutes time for question and answer. And part of their grade is their feedback sheets um, that I create and they are graded based on how the rest of the class grades them. Um, so they have to work together. And what I'm always saying is audience is everything. Your audience is your peers. Do something that makes your peers think, yeah, I'm going along with that. Um, and they and it's worked well. Um, the other thing that I do, and this is in the moot court exercise, which I think actually encompasses this um, debate on both sides, um, learn from your mistakes, is um, I set them up in peer partners. Um, they, they're going to have an opponent in moot court. <laughs> But as well, I give them a peer review partner who I've identified because by mid-semester, I know strengths, weaknesses, challenges, personalities. Two people I'm sure can work well together. The peer review is a component of the grade, and it includes tell your partner how she changed and improved over the course since you first met, which um, And it is part of, of it. Um, and then actually after moot court, those partners will come back again um, and they will be working on the mistake uh, redemption exercise, <laughs> which is to write a paper answering the panelists' question that they really wish that they lost sleep over after that, um, writing that up and assist each other. As well, I do some peer writing critique. And what I also do is I divide every American Constitution class into two groups at the beginning of the semester. I do alphabet, whatever, I try and have a little gender balance. And I um, often break them into small groups during class and say, okay, everybody in group two, 
you are going to come up with an argument that denying contraception coverage is um, sex discrimination and everyone in group one, you're going to come up with an argument that it isn't. Um, and then we do the, the debate as, as Andrea recommended. So I have some assessed group or partner work and some group work that merely consists of, not merely, um, doing something together in class. I did start with the CLEG class this semester actually having them um, offer, one spokesperson offer their reflection on what happened in there onto Blackboard as part of the um, assessed assignment. Thank you. Can I add one thing to that? I, I think one thing I've learned is actually you've got to teach students how to work in groups, um, right, and make that explicit. And so, so I, I oftentimes I would do in class, group work especially, I will lay out, you know, these are the four roles, elect a note taker, a timekeeper, a facilitator, and whatever, right? And you give them roles. Um, I sometimes also constrain the talk in, in sort of strange ways that it will work. I'll say here, you know, the first person will speak for one minute. No one else responds. You take notes. Then two minutes later, right, everybody has a chance to go around and talk about what they heard the first presenter say. And then the first presenter can respond. So there's a great protocol called the final word protocol. And it's the National School Reform Faculty has a, 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 a lot of great um, protocols there. But sometimes that helps students know how to do group work. Yeah. Other observations, comments? Yes, please. Um, I'm Keisha, and I wanted to say to you, Amanda, thank you for sharing your piece about mistakes. And people, everyone has made a lot of mistakes before, of course. No one is perfect. And as I get older, I try very hard to correct my mistakes. You know, that's my thing. I, you know, will go back and correct my mistakes and uh, make it right if I didn't make it right the first time. And also, another thing that I want to point out is I'm thankful for people who will point out my mistakes to me because those are the ones who help me to learn, help me to go through the process. So that's a good thing. And it made me think about this, um, some a quote, and may, some of you may have heard it before. They say, if you correct a fool, he'll hate you for it. But if you correct a wise man, they'll love you for it. So mistakes are definitely important. And thank you for sharing that. Yes. Hi. I am the real imposter in the, in the room right now because I'm not the professor here. I'm just a groupie with the, uh, around Fanta and Amanda. Yeah. <laughs> when, when I heard we did not pay her, I can assure you this. <laughs> but but you did maybe yes. Because I'm not a professor here or anywhere else, but uh, I hang out uh, a lot with academ international academia, and I just wanted to thank you for letting me into this insight, and for uh, and I want to congratulate you all. Um, you know, I deal with all this academia from basically from Latin America where, for instance, in one of the countries very close to the U.S., in North America. Um, uh, no, 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 I mean in North America, not the U.S., but North America. Um, I didn't want to say it. Uh, the, the role, the, the professors uh, at university, the position was inherited. This was, this was until five years ago. And of course, in other countries in Europe, like my native Spain, this professor in engineering uh, with this, the senior class was so proud because, because only 3% of his class passed. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for all you are doing. Thank you for this discussion. I love it. Thank you. Yes. I'm just going to follow up on, on you, actually. And Amanda, I would like first to thank you very much for all your, you know, thoughts. It's been very helpful. I think it's been very helpful for all of us. Some of us have been teaching for years and years and years, and you still learn so much when you come to these events like today. And just following up on, on you, I come from the same country as you do, <laughs> and I live in the other one that is in North America, but it's not the state that is in Canada. So. <laughs>
you know, Jerry to pen sometimes is good. So now I'm very worried that the idea that you have to be successful from the first day, there is no idea about the curving, you know, the learning curve. And this worries me a lot, especially because most of us in my department teach in a target language which is not English. It can be any of the 12 languages that we teach. And, uh, you know, when you are that additional factor that you teach in another language, there's fraternity, frustration, mistakes, all of these comes in a much, you know, kind of intense way. So I do spell out from the beginning that, you know, this is a learning curve. We all get frustrated sometimes, I do as well, and uncertain, and I think I welcome uncertainty in the class. So I try to provoke that uncertainty because you kind of learn without feeling uncertain. observations and then pose a question uh, to our panelists and to everyone with us today. I guess in terms of observation, building on what Nuria just said, I do think there's a real liberating uh, force uh, in our admitting our own mistakes or encouraging the students to admit their mistakes. It um, sort of defuses, if you will, really takes the stinger out. And so I liked um, your exercise very much in that regard. It may help limit the student's anxiety. Uh, levels that we've been seeing. The other observation I was going to offer uh, had to do with, uh, again, lessening the anxiety about participating in class. And I do think your idea of requiring or highly encouraging students to come to office hours is very powerful because I found for myself that uh, very quiet students who came to see me in office hours and who felt comfortable being in conversation in office hours, uh, then carried that over into class. There was a very positive feedback loop uh, in that regard. And so if you do um, strongly encourage or, or require students to come see you in office hours, I think that's going to have a very positive uh, impact. Um, also, I know many of you already do this, but reading response memos, if you have students write up something in advance of class, reflecting on the reading, what they liked, what they didn't like, what was a new idea, what have you, uh, then that may also uh, lower the barrier uh, for them to speak in class. So the question I had um, for the panelists and for the room uh, has to do with what resources can we as a university offer that would support you in your experience of teaching first year students? So uh, what is it that we could be uh, doing or offering uh, that would help you? Um, I'd be very interested to know. I would just jump in and say exactly what Kehoe said. Uh, movable desks, movable chairs, mm -hmm. classrooms yeah. with even industrial carpet like this so we could sit on the floor mm -hmm. if we needed to, um, working AV equipment. Yes. Um, <laughs> those would be pluses. <laughs> Excellent. I use GCOP assistance and they actually are as well a component of the group work. Um, they are peer facilitators, they lead discussions. Um, the unsung hero types, the quiet types, I actually get reports back from, from these um, student assistants and they tell me, uh, you know, I just ask how's everyone doing, who's talking, what are they saying? And there are people for whom the 27 person class is not the place to speak up just as yet. But the eight people who came to Jessica's um, agreeing to disagree exercise uh, is a great uh, place that, that this person can talk. Um, so having that as a resource and actually honestly increasing it, um, this is vital. I think I mentioned these people know how to be college students. They know how to become college students now in re real time. So more of that would be um, really valued and as well, um, this idea of being able to be out, out in the world with your students. I have my students over to my home every semester. I call it Doctrine Donuts and Dog. That we have a snack, we study for the exam, they play with my dog. Um, and, and actually just the resources for my donuts and uh, notepads and things that I, that I use at home um, because I love doing that and I would do it more. Use yes, more, more resources for the writing lab, please, because when we send the students to the writing lab for, uh, you know, editing their papers and other assignments, often enough, uh, they can't find an appointment soon enough. 
And that's some, I'm sorry, that, that's, that's a great comment and something I write into my syllabus. Uh, students that know they will need the writing lab or after their first paper, I send them to the writing lab. Um, and that could be students who uh, don't speak English as a first language or any student who needs extra help. I always give an extension if they can give me the date that they went to the writing lab. Uh, because if you know we have the resources and they're not available within my time frame when the papers do, I will extend uh, the paper deadline for them. Um, a Andrea, I'm, I'm interested. You say the writing lab, and Christian mentioned the writing lab. I send mine to the writing center, and I've always been a little confused about what the difference is between them. But um, one one resource that I found, yeah, Phantom, maybe you can straighten me out, um, or maybe not. Um, I'm, I'm remembering in particular um, a presentation that Fanta give, gave uh, years ago. And it was about first year students, and it said, um, you know, realize that these folks were born in this year, and they've never seen a rotary dial phone, or they've never had a car where you had to crank the window, or they've never, and, and kind of introduced us to, hey, this is the class coming in. This is their world. This is kind of what they, you know, what they dig, what they listen to, how they think. And I, that was really, really helpful because, you know, every four years or five years or so, this stuff changes. And, and it's useful to kind of get in touch with, um, you know, just who these first years are coming in. Um, but I, I always send my students, and, and it's not just the students who need to rewrite their papers. Like, I'm really, really overt about this in the classroom. This idea, I love, Amanda, that you talk about making mistakes. And it was it was fun, because the woman I was chatting with, she and I are both parents, and it's like, oh, you know, your mistakes are in your face all the time. Like, you know, look in the mirror. It's like, oh my gosh. Right? You make mistakes, you know. You know, one every 15 minutes. Um, but, but, you know, to me, um, like, like I always tell the students, I was a terrible writer in college. I was a studio art major, for Pete's sakes. I was a terrible writer in college, and I got to graduate school. And one of my professors wrote on um, my first paper that I turned in, um, your writing obfuscates more than it clarifies. <laughs> and I, I love to share that, that story with the students because it, it was, it was perfect. It was like, yeah, gosh, you know, like, let's be obvious about how writing is a craft yeah. and we could all be better at it, know. you know? And I tell them this and I also say, hey, listen, we could all be better at our relationships, right? <laughs> we could all be better, we could all be healthier in our heads. And then I'll run through the list of resources that are available to them on campus. And I do this multiple times over the semester just to kind of sow the seeds and build a bridge and you may not get them the first time, but there's a certain humility that I think we need to engage in about learning and about life. And I'm so glad, Amanda, that you raised that. I'm gonna use that exercise because I think we could be reminded all the time of even when we're, you know, even when we're good at things, we could be better at things. And it's everybody's in a process. And then if everybody's there, it's okay to, you know, to, to, to be in a stew sometimes and work through it. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for those reminders. One of my good colleagues in SIS, and I can't remember who it was, talked about how she shows the peer review feedback that she gets from articles she submits, like a revise and resubmit, and she shows that to her students to say, even what we submit is torn apart, right? So I can't remember who it was in SIS, but that was a colleague. Yes, please go ahead. Um, so quick question about, um, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, we want students to be able to fail or to be challenged. Um, how do we balance that with like actual grades that impact scholarships and impact their ability to be here? Um, and with other folks around the institution who aren't gonna buy into this, like who aren't necessarily gonna buy into the, we need students to like fail or be challenged. Because um, I talk about that with my students all the time too, but if in three of their classes, it's like hardcore grading, and they are dependent on scholarships, then it, it's hard for them, I think, to wrap, specifically first year students, to wrap their heads around it's okay to fail when they're being told in a lot of sectors that it's not. So like, how, how do we, how could we balance that or how do we talk about it? And that's a much longer discussion than a minute and a half. Um, but just wanted to throw it out there. Could I say something there? I mean, I always tell my students there's no good writing, there's only good rewriting. And, and I think, you know, um, Andrea, you make this point about, you know, rewriting and, and second versions of papers, and I think that's one place where you give them the opportunity to fail and then be very explicit about the opportunity to improve. Right? So you can be really honest the first go round and, and get a chance to, um, to, to point out their mistakes and then kind of support them in, in transitioning to something that's better. I, I offer the 
very first paper, I want it to be pretty soon into the semester, be sort of a check-in, make it worth only about 15% of the grade. And I, I actually will grade it, honestly, maybe a little bit general, generously, but then when someone comes to office hours, which I either encourage or require, depending on the side of the class, I say, okay, the 10 points that you're describing are, you know, but you have to go times 0.15. Um, but I do a few kind of lower stakes um, exercises that give that check-in, and I am now building into every class some things that you can succeed in just by the strong effort. You did this class exercise and did the reflection thing on Blackboard. Um, so when you see that, you know, 81, 79 on that memo um, that hurts, you're getting a sense of, you know, this is the high expectation that I have to work toward meeting at a higher level, but it didn't hurt you in your future and your life. And all of my feedback includes, to take this to the next level, you need to, A, B, C, um, so they can. I think that point there is, it's about improvement, right? I mean, it's not about failure. We're not encouraging everyone getting Fs, right? It's, it's about that in order to improve, there must be some level of risk involved, right? So I think that's the point. Go ahead, yes. Okay, I was gonna follow up on sort of how, how are our students de defining failure? Because it's not an F. Because I, I'm on the reference desk in the library and I'll have students come and say, I totally failed this literature review and, and I have a chance to write and resubmit but I'm worried that I'm not doing my research right because I totally failed it. Okay, let's take a look at this. Let me, let me see this lit review you failed. It's got an 87. Right, so, so their feeling of failure is not attached to the letter F. Their feeling of failure is attached to an 87. So, so that, that safe to fail may mean safe to make a B, right? And that, and, and that yes, there's still room for improvement if the letter grade you got was a B. But, but when, when we talk about students feeling like they failed something, it's not because we're handing them things with an F on it. And, just to, to piggyback on, on that specific um, element, I think one of the things that we, we probably do a lot, but I think we can never do enough, is to figure out how to normalize things for students, right? So for example, this idea of what, is, what does failure represent? Is it the F really or is it the B? I have found that in my classes, it's not only helpful that they understand that the B is not failure, but they need to understand what is the average for that class. Because what that does is also, in many ways, really help the students understand that not only did you get a B, but guess what? 50% or 60% of the class got the same grade. Because there's something about, that is a little bit different about the AU student today, is that they're very much internalizing, internalizing the mixed messages we send. Remember what our story is. Smart, engaged, all of these other things, right? So they're coming in and we say, you know, they're the 10% of their class. So they're coming in already with that in mind. And being the 10, sort of 10% sort of high end of the class, it means that they came out of their courses, they came out of high school with A's. This is the first time that they've seen maybe a B grazing in a while. Their world is falling apart. And the reality is, guess what? This is the world you're gonna be navigating and the world you're gonna be living in. And so there are a couple of things that I really wanted to kind of reemphasize from the conversation today that I think we all really need to leave with and continue to remember. And that is, it's really critical that we know how to normalize the gray areas. Our students really know things black and white. That is what they know, that's what they navigate. And we need to figure out ways to reinforce that there's gonna be a lot of gray and a lot of discomfort. And that, it's, in fact, that is good. And you're gonna be struggling with that. I think that's important. Also, I think Andrea said, and I can't emphasize enough, we need to be clear and we need to tell them again and again and again our expectations. To assume that because we told them at the front end, they got it, or to even assume we just repeated it a week ago, they got it, every single time that we know they're gonna be devastated, expectations <laughs> are rolled out again for them to remember. There was also the comment that I think Kiho made, which is we need to figure out how do we humanize faculty. I hate to say this, I mean, when we stand up in front of the class, for a lot of the students, they see us as really archaic. And this may be shocking to many of us because we're like, wait a minute. We are in tune with a lot of what's going on. But I'll be honest with you, when you hear the conversations that students are having among themselves, and you're like, what did they just say? You realize how out of touch, frankly, 
You are, and that's okay. We don't have to be their friends. But we do need to humanize what it means to be a faculty and what that looks like. And I think that's something that we cannot lose sight of. And then the other piece that I do want to bring up, because we didn't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I think it's important is, we also have to be very aware of the enabling behaviors that are counterproductive. I think all too often, we so spend time on helping to figure out what does success look like, that we forget to remind our students that you don't just get there. You just didn't wake up one morning and you're there. And so the enabling behaviors that we keep reinforcing, the students keep looking for those behaviors everywhere they go, and then the cognitive dissonance comes up when they come across that one faculty who decides to tell them the reality in a way that they've not heard for a while. And then you find yourself having to pick up the pieces for a while, because that student has just fallen apart. And I think a big part of that is because we all need to be reinforcing some of the same messages so that the students know that, you know what, this is a community of support. It's going to challenge you like you've never been challenged, but it's also a community of support, and this is what it looks like. And I think that's one of the things that we, I think it's a fine balance, but I think it's a really important balance for us to continue to create for our students. So thank you to our panelists. <laughs> thank you to all of us uh, for everyone joining us. It really is a conversation. So I look forward to the conversation continuing. Thank you. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning yes. for once again putting together and going to the heavy lifting of this. So to Marilyn, Naomi, and to Anna and everybody else from the center, thanks again for all your, your hard work. <laughs>